All right, thanks very much, Beth. I'm gonna try and multitask here and talk about myself while also sharing my screen. So I, it's nice to see a few familiar uh, names and faces in the group today, so that's exciting. And uh, you guys are all the test run. This is the first viewing of this presentation. So I am super excited. Um, you know, as Beth mentioned, I have been in the, the business of promoting Michigan for many years, but my fascination with lighthouses actually began uh, in the late 1990s. And at that point, I was working for a group in Grand Rapids called the West Michigan Tourist Association. And my very first project with them was their Lake Michigan Circle Tour and Lighthouse Guide. And the 35th edition of that just came out uh, in, just in the last week or so. And anybody who is fascinated with lighthouses will probably understand it when I say, when you start researching lighthouses, it becomes a quick addiction. You are overwhelmed with not only the history of the lights in the communities, but particularly with the cures. Uh, who are so dedicated and committed to their service, uh, whether it was for a weekend or for a lifetime. And one of the presentations that I have is called Ladies of the Lights, and it's about female lighthouse keepers. And there were about 50 of them in, in Michigan's history that really had kind of stepped up and helped out their husbands or their fathers, their brothers, and were uh, instrumental in that service. And Elizabeth, in my opinion, is the, uh, the epitome of this just matriarchal uh, lighthouse keeper here for the state of Michigan. And, and we have a lot of other women um, that did great things, but she served an extensive amount of time and she was just um, a pioneer. And I think what really sealed that with me for her was reading um, her uh, autobiography, which is called The Child of the Sea. And it really, it just made me love her even more. And I have been actively uh, researching her. And, and it was funny because in the, in the main Ladies of the Lights, you know, I, I only get to spend a couple of minutes talking about her to, and, and all the other women, but I just couldn't get her family history out of my mind. And it's just such a, a great story. So I'm excited tonight to tell you some of her backstory uh, about her childhood and her family, and then certainly about her service as a lighthouse keeper. So Elizabeth was born on Mackinac Island in 1844. Her mother was also named Elizabeth, Elizabeth Cross, and her father's name was Walter, Whit Walter Whitney. And this was her mother's second marriage. Um, the, um, the mother, Elizabeth, her first husband's name was Louis Gebaugh, and she had four sons, um, Louis, uh, Tony, Charles, and then an unnamed son who, uh, who died. And uh, Louis Gebaugh actually drowned in a boating accident in 1841. And so Elizabeth, Geb uh, Elizabeth Cross Gebaugh had to remarry, and she married Walter Whitney and Elizabeth Whitney Van Riper Williams, the woman of our program, uh, was the only child born of um, of that marriage, but it's a there's a, a little bit of a backstory that's kind of interesting um, about Elizabeth Cross. She was actually born um, on Mackinac, either Mackinac Island or New York. There are a couple of discrepancies in some of the legal documents, but she was born in 1796, and uh, her mother was a Native American named Angelica, and her father's name was John Cross, and he, both of her parents died when she was young, and she was actually adopted uh, by a well-known man from Mackinac Island named Captain Michael Dousman and his wife, Catherine. And they eventually had nine biological children. But if you go through their, um, their family records, uh, Elizabeth Cross, I know, uh, she's often called Elizabeth Cross Dousman, um, was right there and raised alongside of those biological children. Now, Dousman himself was really fascinating in that he was an agent for the John Jacob Astor Fur Company. He was one of the richest men in the area. He owned tracts of land on Mackinac Island and in Mackinac City. And in fact, he owns what is now historic Mill Creek. Uh, over on the east side of Mackinac on Lake Huron. 
Um, and he himself had a pretty extensive pedigree. He was um, the son of John Dousman and Catherine Barrickman Dousman. Uh, they were immigrants from Holland and Germany, respectively. And family lore has it that they were descendants of a Dutch noble family the Baron von Dousman family. So it's kind of just interesting to see where our young Elizabeth came from and, and what her um, what her mother had gone through uh, prior to her uh, to her birth. Um, Walter Whitney, so Whitney's father, was born in Genesee County, New York, and he enlisted in 1832 and served in the Black Hawk War. Uh, according to Elizabeth's autobiography, he was uh, honorably discharged uh, from Fort Brady in, uh, in Sault Ste. Marie in 1837, and he was a private in Company B. And from there, he actually relocated down to Mackinac Island, and that is where he met the widow Elizabeth Cross Gabbaugh. And he um, found a new profession after serving in the um, in the military. And he became a shipbuilder, and he soon took his family um, from Mackinac Island through the Straits over to the 266-acre island known as St. Helena Island. And this island had been purchased uh, by two brothers by the name of Archie and Wilson uh, Newton. Uh, it's interesting that there are some who claim that these brothers were descendants of Sir Isaac Newton. So I had to go down that rabbit hole a little bit to see if I could actually prove that they were related. Um, but in fact, uh, Sir Isaac Newton uh, never married. In fact, they say that he died a virgin and he was an avid supporter of abstinence. So I don't think that they were actually descendants. Maybe they were uh, very distant or long lost cousins, um, but I haven't continued to dig down that family tree quite yet. Uh, so here we have Walter Whitney. He shows up in um, in the late 1840s, and young Elizabeth is about three years old, and her brothers are her older brothers or half brothers are with her, and they come here to St. Helena Island because um, Walter is hired by the the Newton brothers to build a ship for them. Um, and they have a thriving fishing community that's established here at this point. Um, on the island, and uh, they need to have uh, a boat to kind of do some of their transporting of their goods and supplies. And so in, um, in the book, uh, and I have a first edition copy of this, which is one of my most treasured possessions. Um, I just did a, a quick photograph of her, and I want to read excerpts from this um, book this evening because... Um, Elizabeth wrote this in 1905, but was, she was so eloquent, I think, in her writing. And even though um, some of the early parts, including this part here, was written um, or was based on a story of when she was just three or four years old, um, clearly her mother and her family were able to provide her with the information um, that, uh, that she needed to, to, turn, to make this into her story. So she says they, meaning the Newton brothers, needed a good vessel for their trading purposes and concluded to have one built for themselves. My father, being a ship carpenter, signed a contract to build their ship, which was to be named Eliza Caroline, in honor of the brothers' wives, who were sisters. And long the Eliza Caroline sailed on Lake Michigan, carrying 13000 sub dollars worth of merchandise and fish, doing her work nobly and well. The building of the ship brought our family to the dear little island of St. Helena. Now, at this time, there were about 25 families, uh, as she notes, living on the island. And she continues on to say, time was drawing near to the finishing of the ship, the good ship Eliza Caroline. The hammers could be heard from early dawn till dark. Seams were being caulked. There was painting and oiling going on from day to day. Many were gathering from near and far to watch the process of launching the ship. The little village was bustling with people. Every home was full for friends had come to stay a week. My parents told me afterward the launching was a grand success. The sails and all ropes and rigging had come from Buffalo, New York. The trial trip was to Mackinac Island and return and nearly all of the people in the little town took passage. 
uh, from here, um, and in 1850, so this would have been, uh, actually Elizabeth would have been about six years old at this point, the 1850 census does show that the Whitney family was living on St. Helena Island, which was in uh, Michelin Mackinac or Mackinac County. And Elizabeth then wrote in her story, in her book, that they uh, moved from uh, St. Helena Island and they took a boat up and went up and did some work in Manistique in the Upper Peninsula. And she writes, my father was sent far from Manistique. Mr. Frankel had settled there and put in a mill. He was an old friend of my father's coming from Chagrin Falls, Ohio. Offering good pay, father concluded to accept and we prepared to move at once. The schooner Nancy, also owned by the Newton brothers, was to take us to our destination. One still cold morning in November, our boat was prepared and we started to Manistique, 10 miles distant. So I contacted um, the Schoolcraft County Historical Society because I was intrigued by this Mr. Frankel and his, um, his mill there on the river in Manistique. And he was not able to uh, find anybody with that name or anyone operating a mill with a similar type name in the history of Manistique. And he suggested that perhaps um, Elizabeth's mother, as she was recounting these stories to her later on, perhaps got the name wrong. Um, but we do know that the family um, settled in this area of Manistique for one winter. And, and Elizabeth goes into great detail in her book about some of the stories and activities that were taking place here. And um, they quickly became friends with a lot of the Native Americans in this area. And she references in here um, the Indian village, which was about three miles distant from the shore and the river's mouth. And there was this large settlement of about 700 people um, at that point. Um, and there were some accounts of um, the family's engagement with um, many people in the tribe, including the chief of the tribe and his daughter. Um, and nearby in this area in Indian Lake is uh, the site of Bishop Baraga's first mission in the Upper Peninsula. And so this does really um, jive with the, the recollections that, that Elizabeth has uh, in the book with, with their connections here. And they were some kind of harrowing stories in here about one win, uh, part of the winter um, where you have snow situations and people going off looking for other people who have who've kind of disappeared and, and what the family goes through during some of those uh, situations and anybody who lives, uh, you know, close to the shoreline knows what uh, how how strong and fierce the winters can be at times. Um, and so just knowing in, in that time period, living in in shacks and huts and things like that, it would have been even much more um, challenging, I think, for them. So they just spent the one winter here in Manistique, and from there they made their way south down to Beaver Island. Uh, this was also then uh, part of Manitou County before it became Charlevoix County, and they arrived here um, in the late 18, or the early 1850s. Um, and of course, at this time, there was one man who was dominating things on Beaver Island, and that was uh, King James Strang. He was the self-proclaimed king of his Mormon flock on the island. He arrived there in 1844, and at one point, he had over 12,000 in his congregation, uh, also ran for Michigan and served in Michigan House of Representatives. Um, and the subtitle of Elizabeth's book, uh, so it, it's primarily known as The Child of the Sea, uh, but in later printings, it's called A Child of the Sea and Life Among Mormons. Um, and, it, and it talks a lot about um, their family and their perception of Strang and his lifestyle. Um, it was a very tumultuous time for most people on the island, except for those that were in Strang's inner circle. Uh, he had a belief that what his was his and what was yours was his. And he, and she talks about it in the book, he would come into a house and demand um, nets or boats for his fishing crews. He wanted to, uh, to dominate there. He would order people in the, um, in the community to come and work for him. 
and you feared for your safety if you did not do these things. And um, so it was it was really, I imagine, very um, scary for Elizabeth and her siblings, uh, as well as her parents, to be there uh, during this time period. Um, they got there and, and in, in about uh, 1860, King Strang decided that he um, would need to, or sorry, in, the, in 1850s, he decided he needed to have this cottage built. Um, and so they actually uh, hired, or I guess comm commissioned Elizabeth's father to, um, to help build this. And she says in her book about this time, King Strang decided to build a residence for himself and he made the plans and called it the King's Cottage. The King came, from our, came to our house asking my father to go to the harbor and help build his house. He wanted him to do the framing and father not being very busy and not liking to refuse the King went. Father was gone about six weeks, coming home often to see how we were at home. He boarded at the house where there were four wives. The king's cottage was built very strong, a story and a half high with a porch across the front. The wide hall went right through the center, a massive strong door at the front and the back and with a wide open staircase. On each side of the hall was a large room, two bedrooms, hall and closets upstairs a white picket fence around the yard with a nice garden spot on the hillside. It was a pleasant, cozy home, and the location was most beautiful, looking out at the harbor and Lake Michigan. The house was in the midst of a lovely grove of forest trees, maple, beech, oak, and scattering evergreens. The cottage was built under the small hill or terrace on a level flat and just a short distance from the dock and shores. Now, interestingly enough, after Strang was killed by his followers, um, many years later, after Elizabeth and her family returned, her mom and dad actually lived in this house in 1860, which was, I think, kind of an interesting little side note there. Uh, given the growing volatility on the island, things were uh, continuing to be cont uh, contemptuous there. Elizabeth and her brothers were often sent to live with other people um, for their safety. And this was a very common thing. And she writes, one of our boarders, Mr. William Hill, was anxious to take my brother Charlie home, which was Painesville, Ohio, with him, put him to school and teach him the engineer's trade. Charlie was to remain with Mr. Hill until he was 21, he being past 10 now. So I saw a lot of this where they were sending the children off um, for a better life. They were sending them to learn um, trades. They were sending them to school. They were sending them away to keep them safe from the Strang, the Strangites who were growing in um, numbers on the island. And um, so not only was brother Charlie sent to live with Mr. Hill, but her older brother Lewis had been sent out. Um, and there were a lot of um, uh, families that kind of were in there from uh, Painesville, Ohio that summered up on Beaver Island. And so while Charlie went to the Hill House, uh, Lewis uh, was sent also. And then Elizabeth herself was about sent about the age of seven or eight to live temporarily with a man by the name of Milton A. Shepard um, and the families that kind of went there. So it was quite a distance. And so she even talks about um, boarding this large um, steamer, the steamer, the Michigan, and going from Beaver Island all the way down to Painesville um, and then living there. Uh, often these, these kids were um, uh, brought in to help clean at these houses. So they were um, kind of child labor. They were also there to help. Uh, Elizabeth talks about even being seven or eight, helping clean the house, but also helping take care of the shepherd's younger children. Um, so it was an, an interesting time period, um, but certainly it kept her and her brothers safe um, from what was going on on Beaver Island. Now, in the mid uh, to mid part of the 1850s, the Whitney's, uh, by this point, Elizabeth had made it back to Beaver Island, but then the whole family uh, kind of relocated to Traverse City for a brief period of time. And Elizabeth was very excited because she was going to go to school for the first time. And uh, she says the schoolhouse, which was actually first built in 1853, 
was near the riverbank, just about opposite the river's mouth. It stood back um, far enough for a good wide street. It was in the midst of a pretty grove of small oak trees that reached their branches far out, giving cool shade where we could sit and eat our lunch. The evergreens and maple trees were mixed about, giving it a variety of change. Wild roses grew everywhere. It was truly an ideal spot that we never tired of. Our teacher was Miss Helen Goodale. Now, Helen was 15 years old when she started teaching uh, here at the school. The first school in Traverse City started in 1853, and it was in a converted stable um, on East Front Street. And uh, this is where the classes were held. And it was noted as the first school north of Manistee in the Lower Peninsula that was not associated with one of the missions. Now, 1853 was also the year that the first post office came to Traverse City, and that was actually run by Miss Goodale's father. Uh, Elizabeth continues uh, about this. Uh, she's very excited about school, but she says the next year more people came and more uh, scholars. Our little schoolhouse was filled. We were happy a lot, seeming uh, almost like one family. We drank from the same cup, swung on the same swing, sharing our lunches together. And no matter where we have roamed throughout the wide world, can we forget that the little log schoolhouse, I've seen it, even seen it many times in my dreams and the happy faces of each as we tried to excel to please the teacher. We all loved her, though trying her patience often, yet we knew and felt she loved us. Oh, happy school days and pleasant school companions. I read her pieces um, because, I, like I said before, I think she just has such a beautiful way with words and such a, a wonderful memory. Uh, clearly, this would have been her memory, not her mother's memory, because her mother wouldn't have been at school with her um, at that point. Now, during their time in Traverse City, uh, the older brothers at this point were either off living with other people or had grown up on their own. Um, but she does know that father and mother adopted a little boy named Frank, and she was so happy she had a brother for co company, and little Frank was very happy with us. So uh, Frank was actually uh, a seven-year-old boy named Frank Churchill. Churchill. Uh, his mother had passed away, and his father could not take care of him or his older sister, Amelia, or his younger brother, George. And so um, the Whitney's actually adopted little Frank, and he even shows up in the 1860 census living with Elizabeth and Walter uh, at the age of 15 by the time they're back um, up on Beaver Island. But little is known about him after that fact. Um, now, when the assassination of King Strang takes place, um, word does make its way down to the Whitney family in Traverse City and uh, this is an interesting little note. I must hurry now over many things that have happened while at Traverse City. So now that Strang is dead and his, um, his community is dissolving, the Whitney's feel it is safe finally for them to go back to Beaver Island. And so uh, they, they head back there. Uh, Elizabeth at this point in 56, she would have been 12. And uh, she is excited to be back, um, continuing her schooling on Beaver Island. At this point, the population of the entire Manitou County, which encompassed Beaver Island, was about a thousand, uh, just over a thousand people. Um, and then uh, four years after she gets there, uh, she actually gets married. She's 16 years old um, in 1860 when she marries. Clement Van Riper or Van Ripper. Um, and uh, he was a cooper. He made barrels on the island. He was from um, Detroit and he came up to Beaver Island for the fresh air, for his health. And uh, so he, he worked as a cooper and he would make barrels so that the fishermen on the island could then pack those barrels with fish and salt and then send uh, those off to be sold as the commercial fishing industry was taking off um, in this area. So she gets married in 1860 and um, 
They spend uh, a winter, 1861, in Milwaukee, and then they return to Beaver Island, uh, specifically to Garden Island, which is uh, in the archipelago. Uh, it was inhabited at that point by about um, 200 uh, Native Americans, and they would fish and farm there. And so Elizabeth and Clement were actually teachers at this uh, through the Department of the Interior, and they taught the Native Americans uh, how to farm. So here are the islands out there. Um, so not very far from Beaver Island, but they actually were there for, I think, two years uh, during the summer season uh, teaching for them. And she says, in July of 1862, my husband was appointed as a government school teacher to the Indians at Garden Island. The school was a large one as there was a large band of Indians. Our school continued for two years, then was discontinued for several years before another teacher was sent among them. That two years was a very busy life for us. Now, um, after his term as a teacher on Garden Island, Clement was actually uh, drafted into the Civil War, although there is no record of him actually serving. Um, but his next profession is the one that was the, um, the most notable for him. Um, and uh, that took place in 1869. Um, here in this picture of the lighthouse, that's um, Keeper uh, Peter McKinley and his daughters, Effie and Mary McKinley. And he was the lightkeeper at the Whiskey Point Light on Beaver Island for about seven, eight, maybe nine years, most of the 1960s, although he had ill health. And so his daughters, when they became teenagers, they assisted with those duties. And that was actually very common for families to, um, to help. Uh, the lighthouse keepers were employees of the federal government, but there was no such thing as unemployment, disability, pension, um, so if the keeper could not do his job and the fa uh, like he would lose the job. So often the families would help out in order to uh, maintain their home because this is their house uh, and the salary that they were uh, receiving. Um, and so when he finally resigned in 1869, uh, that was a pretty big deal for um, for Elizabeth and, and Clement. So she notes, in August of 1869, Mr. Peter McKinley um, resigned his position as light keeper and my husband being appointed in his place. Then began a new life. Other business was discontinued and all our time was devoted to the care of the light. A new fourth order lens was placed in the to new tower and the color of the light changed from white to red. These improvements were a great addition to the station from what it had been. Our tower was built round with a winding staircase of iron steps. We burned the lard oil, which needed great care, especially in cold weather, when the oil would congeal and fail to flow fast enough to the wicks. In long nights, the lamps had to be trimmed twice each night and sometimes oftener. At such times, the light needed careful watching. My husband having very poor health, I took charge of the care of the lamps and the beautiful lens in the tower was my especial care. On stormy nights, I watched the light that no accident might happen. From the first, the work had a fascination for me. I loved the water having always been near it and I loved to stand in the tower and watch the great rolling waves chasing and tumbling in upon the shore. It was hard to tell when it was its loveliest whether in a quiet mood or in a raging foam. Now, Clement's service as the lighthouse keeper in, uh, at St. James Harbor Light at Whiskey Point, which is one of two lighthouses on the island, was short-lived. Um, in 1872, uh, Elizabeth notes, one dark and stormy night, we heard the flapping of sails and saw the flashing lights in the darkness. A ship was in distress. After a hard struggle, she reached the harbor and was sinking so badly or leaking so badly, she sank. My husband, in his efforts to assist them, lost his life. He was drowned with a companion, the first mate of the schooner, the Thomas Howland. And the bodies were never recovered. And only those who have passed through the same know what a sorrow it is to lose your loved one by drowning and never be able to recover the remains. It is a sorrow that never ends through life. She later wrote, 
Life to me then seemed darker than the midnight storm that raged for three days upon the deep, dark waters. I was weak from sorrow, but realized that though the life that was dearest to me had gone, yet there were others out on the dark and treacherous waters who needed to catch the rays of the shining light from my lighthouse tower. Nothing could rouse me but that thought. Then all my life and energy was given to the work which now seemed was given me to do. The lighthouse was the only home I had, and I was glad and willing to do my best in the service. My appointment came in a few weeks after, and since that time I have tried faithfully to perform my duty as a lightkeeper. At first I felt almost afraid to assume so great a responsibility, knowing it all required watchful care and strength with many sleepless nights. I now felt a deeper interest in our sailors' lives than ever before, and I longed to do something for humanity's sake, as well as earn my own living, having aged an aged mother dependent on me for a home. Now, there are no photographs of um, Clement or of the schooner, the Thomas Howland, although I have looked far and wide for both. Um, but there were a few newspaper accounts of the accident which took Clement's life. Uh, at least three of those that I were that I found very all very short uh, death record notices, um, and then this is the official death record that you can see on that last line and uh, noting that uh, that he died from drowning. Now it was interesting after um, after Clement's death, Elizabeth inherited his estate, and a few years prior, after they had been married. Um, he had actually acquired some property on the mainland, um, but this was actually contested after his de death. Uh, his sister uh, really wanted to get her hands on that property. And there was this huge document that I found, I believe through Ancestry, that was uh, court transcripts from 18... Uh, uh, 1898 years later that was related to this property and how his sister thought she was entitled to that. Um, but in the end, Elizabeth prevailed. Um, but it was kind of interesting to see uh, court transcripts uh, from that time period um, in her attempts that there were witnesses that had to attest to who she was and that she was married to Clement and when they were married and where they lived. Um, but I just thought it had a lot, that sister had a lot of nerve coming after um, Elizabeth's property after she had lost her husband there uh, during that shipwreck. Um, Elizabeth and Clement never had any children. Um, and she ended up losing a lot of folks in her family um, early on. Uh, her her father, Walter, died in Milwaukee in 1870. He died. Um, and then following that was her brother, Lewis. Um, and I'll dig into his story here in just a second. He died in a shipwreck. Um, her mother, Elizabeth, um, what a name, Elizabeth Cross Dousman Gebel Williams, uh, which is spelled wrong, I see there. Um, she died in Harbor Springs in 1896, and she's actually buried in the cemetery in town uh, under the name um, and uh, under the name of um, Elizabeth Williams. And then uh, brother Tony died in 1905, and the only one of her um, the only one of her brothers to live into adulthood was her brother Charles, who's pictured here. And um, because Elizabeth never had children, it, it fell to her nephew, uh, Charles's son, Harry Edgar, to kind of take care of her uh, later on in life. And we'll, we'll catch up with him in a little bit as well. So real quick, I wanted to jump back um, to brother Lewis, and he died in the sinking of the steamer, the Vernon. Uh, in 18, October of 1887. And the Vernon left Frankfort, Michigan, headed across Lake Michigan, and there was a storm that came up. Um, and the boat, they say, was um, 
overloaded and they couldn't really get all of the cargo doors shut. And so when this storm came in, um, it, it, you know, the water just really seeped in very quickly and ended up taking the ship down um, overnight. It was actually the very early morning hours around three or four in the morning of Saturday, October uh, 29th. And it went down just east of Raleigh or Two Rivers Point, Wisconsin. Uh, there was a crew of about 45 or 50 people and there was only one survivor, which was a 23 year old immigrant from Sweden who had been the watchman on the ship. Um, so um, Elizabeth's brother was one of the ones who died that day. Um, the shipwreck uh, was actually discovered in 1869 and it lies intact off the coast there in about 210 feet of water. And uh, there are still quite a few um, remnants of that uh, ship. Um, the hull is keeled over to the starboard and then the cargo fish boxes and other artifacts were still noted um, as part of that wreckage according to the um, Wisconsin Shipwrecks um, website. So Elizabeth, um, you know, when I mentioned and read that excerpt about how um, she, you know, felt that she had to do, do something for humanity's sake um, and to protect other keepers, uh, it was, you know, writing this book in, in the early 1900s, she had a little bit more knowledge, but it was, you know, a, a real thing for her to do to kind of protect people, uh, protect the mariners that were out there knowing that um, she had lost so many men in her family, uh, even her mother's first husband and, um, and some of her brothers and nephews. And, um, and I think she did it because she wanted to not only protect them when they were out on the water, but also to protect their families, knowing how heartbroken it was that she had lost loved ones um, on the Great Lakes. She didn't want other families to go through that either. And I think that that was just an added level of why she felt compelled um, to be a keeper. Uh, so she continues on in her book, I now married again, still holding my position as light keeper. Since my marriage, my official title has been Mrs. Daniel Williams. Having a desire to change my residence from the island to the mainland, I made a request to be changed to a mainland light station. I was soon transferred to the Little Traverse Light Station at Harbor Springs, uh, Michigan. The lighthouse just finished, the lamp being lighted for the first time, September 25th of 1884. The light station is situated on the extreme end of Harbor Point at the entrance of Little Traverse Harbor. So, um... At this point, 1884, she has put in a significant amount of her career time um, on Beaver Island. So they moved into the lighthouse in 1869. Uh, uh, 1869, she kind of took over as the head keeper in 1872. And here we now have 1884, where she is um, transferring to Harbor Springs. So this is the light that was built there in 1884. Um, and she became the very first keeper of this light. Her salary during her tenure here was anywhere from $540 to $560 a year. That doesn't seem like a lot of money, um, although it should be noted that female keepers drew the same salary as male keepers. So when she took over at Beaver Island uh, after her first husband died, and she was appointed, her salary was the same as what his was. And this was consistent uh, in the lighthouse service, at least in the Great Lakes region, um, where the women earned comparable salary, which was really significant. Um, I mean, the fact that these women were given government jobs in the first place was noteworthy, but for them to be paid the same was, was also recognizable. So, uh, September of 1884, the light has just been put into service and uh, she and Daniel moved to Harbor Springs and she took care of the light and he ran his own business uh, in town. Uh, she says, just a few hours passed when we steamed into Little Traverse Harbor and the red light, just like the one we had left, was flashing its rays over the waters of Little Traverse Bay for the first time. The water was calm and still. 
The red light shone deep into the quiet waters, and many eyes were watching the bright rays from the lighthouse tower, and the wish of their hearts had been gr gratified in having a lighthouse on Harbor Point to guide steamers and vessels into the harbor. The evening was clear, and the picture was a lovely one as we rounded the point so near the light. Some passengers said to me, here is your home. Don't you know the red light is giving you a welcome? Yes, it was all one's heart could wish. Yet I felt there was another I had left in the old home that was now just a little more dearer to my heart. Next morning, we drove through the resort grounds to Harbor Point Lighthouse, as it is known by the land people. But to the mariner, it is Little Traverse Lighthouse. We were soon at work putting our house in order and the beautiful lens in the tower seemed to be appealing to me for care and polishing, which I could not resist. And since that time, I have given my best efforts to keep my light shining from the lighthouse tower. So uh, while Elizabeth was actively serving as the first keeper of this light, Daniel actually ran a photography studio in downtown Harbor Springs. Uh, Beth and I have been trying to figure out where that would have been. So if anybody happens to know, we'd love to have that information. Um, these are some of, um, of Daniel's photos. And it was funny, I didn't even notice it at first until Beth mentioned it to me last week. But in the lighthouse photo, you can see what appears to be Elizabeth maybe there standing in the doorway um, there. And so, you know, it was, it was also great that, you know, Daniel had his own interest in his own career and he wasn't uh, threatened by this powerful woman he was married to, who was a, uh, one of the few female keepers and government employees on the lighthouse circuit. Um, so he took a lot of photographs of um, the lighthouse and some of the activities in the area several of which um, original prints, I believe, or, or glass prints maybe are at the museum there. Beth can probably answer that at the end. Um, but it was just really great because it allowed him to document uh, their time um, in Harbor Springs. I love this one, they, they called her Libby. A little postcard from Libby and Dan. Um, so Elizabeth and uh, as I said, never had children with either husband, um, but they had a great number of friends um, in both communities. They often hosted musical gatherings at the lighthouse, uh, either on the grounds or in the parlor. And one um, Charlevoix newspaper noted that Mr. and Mrs. Williams were well-known as musicians, this accomplishment resulting no doubt from the necessity of providing their own entertainment during long hours of lighthouse vigil. In the early days, they were in great demand to furnish music for dances, many times at distant points. And Mr. Williams often related fiddling at Northern Michigan's first 4th of July celebration in Sheboygan. Mrs. Williams played the piano and the mouth organ together, and Mr. Williams was equally proficient in the violin, accordion, and numerous reed instruments until ill health prevented they entertained hosts of friends with their music. Um, during her service, um, Elizabeth was also celebrated for her dedication. And I believe she had won a, an award or two for her, um, her service as a keeper of the light. Um, and we have several newspaper articles um, that uh, account for this. Now, this is a anybody who does historical research knows that there are often conflicts in dates in terms of um, when things actually took place. So depending on which source you review, Elizabeth, um, some say like her obituary, for example, notes that she uh, retired in 1906. However, all of the newspaper articles um, note that are noted here are from 2014. And if you do the math of um, 44 years, uh, that is uh, in keeping with the 2000 or with the 1914 retirement date. So um, I'm not exactly sure where the 1906 retirement date came from at first. Um, but I believe that it is accurate that she, she did work there until 1914. 
Um, however, in 1909, she, she actually bought a house for her and Daniel in Charlevoix. So that kind of plays into that 1906 timeline. So, um, but they ended up buying um, a house right overlooking Lake Michigan in Charlevoix. And the house was um, previously owned by a Nettie Eslow. And it was in an area known as the Fox and Eaton addition to Charlevoix. And it's today located at 405 Michigan Avenue. Hopefully the person who owns this house isn't on the program because I went and took pictures there yesterday. Um, and it was interesting because the first photograph I had of the house was just the front view and it looked very tiny and I didn't realize that it, that it overlooked Lake Michigan, but just take a look at, you know, on a, on a $400 or $500 salary, the fact that, you know, Daniel did work, but she was, she was keeping track of her money in order to save it up to purchase um, this beautiful house. Now, what they bought was um, not this house. They actually had this one uh, added on to or, or modified on the property. Um, but what a beautiful home uh, in 1912, which again, kind of supports that earlier retirement date, um, the uh, true cash value of the home that they lived in was uh, just over $5,000. Now that would equate to just under $150,000 today. Um, but it had a walk down stair, uh, set of steps. Um, this photo on the left is actually a public walkway right next to the house that goes down to the beach. And then there was uh, a set of steps from the back of this property as well that, that went down to, uh, to the lake. The property today, um, the true ca cash value of this house today is uh, $1.1 million. So uh, certainly a lot different today um, than, uh, than what Elizabeth and Daniel had, but certainly her love of the water and the lake kept her um, per, you know, kept her near this area so that she could always have her water views. Um, the Charlevoix County clerk was able to track down some information. This is uh, the document on the left is the, um, is the deed for when they purchased the property on Michigan Avenue from Nettie Eslow. And then um, they ended up selling that property uh, in 1925, and they moved a few blocks uh, south and away from the water uh, to 303 Mason Street. And that's what this house looks like um, today. So I think, you know, certainly as they were getting on in their years, um, the bigger house with the stairs um, was probably getting to be way too much for them uh, to take care of. And this would have been a much simpler house. Uh, the 1930 census, uh, so if they had been here for five years at this point, shows that, um, that they are living in this house. At this point, Elizabeth is 85. Daniel, who is younger, he's 78, and living with them as a live-in servant and perhaps um, a bit of a nurse, uh, given the age of Annie, Aunt Elizabeth and Daniel, was a woman by the name of Ada Green. And she, I believe, had been um, living on Beaver Island. So maybe they knew her uh, when they were there. So Elizabeth and Daniel were married for 63 years. So they had a nice, fulfilling 25-year life uh, after retirement, uh, where they got to uh, visit and hang out in Charlevoix. Um, and I believe this is also um, their nephew, uh, Harry Edgar Gebaugh, who was um, living in Charlevoix, was assisting and taking care of them uh, during these later years as well. Um, in January of 1838, Daniel uh, and Elizabeth passed away within 28 hours of each other. Um, and, uh, he was 87. She was 93 at the time. And, uh, they reference her book, of course, in this short, um, death notice. This is a, a little bit larger one from the Charlevoix Courier, um, in the days after their, uh, their passing. And this is where I actually got the information about the musical, inst all the musical instruments, uh, that they played. Um, but uh, they had a, a, a double 
service. And uh, the two of them are buried at Brookside Cemetery in Charlevoix, which is there on the intersection of M66 and US 31. And um, this was all handled by uh, Harry Gebaugh, who was the executor of their estate. So that's why we see aunt and uncle. Um, yesterday, I uh, made it over to Charlevoix. So I visited with or visited and took pictures of the two houses yesterday. And then I went to the cemetery uh, and took this photograph. And in any of the research that I've been doing for my books or anything, it's, it's always important for me to, um, to visit the cemeteries. I mean, I grew up as a historian and a, a genealogy um, fanatic because of my dad. And we spent a lot of time doing uh, family research in cemeteries when I was in elementary school. And so um you know, going into the cemetery and paying my respects and especially for someone uh, like Elizabeth, who whose story just continues to draw me in and, and how inspiring she was. So it was, it was a pretty emotional afternoon when I was down there um, at the cemetery uh, with them for that for that brief period of time. Um, if anybody's interested, this is just kind of the location of where uh, their, um, where their graves are located. Um, and then Gary, uh, uh, Harry Gebaugh and his wife, Mary Alice, who went by the name Alice, they are buried there right next to, um, to Elizabeth and Daniel. And, uh, then this is just the statement, the probate statement that shows that he was the, um, executor of their estate. Uh, Let's see. Come on. Now my screen doesn't want to advance. That's not a good thing. Good thing we're closer to the end of the program. Oh, oh now it's going to go all, go all kinds of crazy on me. All right. Um, so these are the death certificates for both of them. And it's interesting that senility is listed as the cause of death for both. And I don't know if that was actually the case or if it was just um, that in, uh, in 1938, if old age was just a contributing factor on that as well. Um, and so if anybody, I, I, if anybody's interested in more, I really, I cannot recommend enough sitting down and reading Elizabeth's book, A Child of the Sea. It to me is kind of like, you know, if, if Little House on the Prairie was set in Michigan on the Great Lakes, it was just a story of pioneer families and their struggles and their survival and their history. And, and I'm so thankful that she uh, took the time in the early 1900s before she retired um, to write these stories. I mean, her mother passed away in the, in, um, the late 1800s. So she had clearly, um, you know, maybe took notes or had recollections of conversations with her mother before her mother passed away. Um, and I had had a copy of this book, um, like a reprint that I got through Amazon. And I had always had it highlighted and marked all up with those excerpts at the end about her years at the lighthouse that I would read during my ladies of the lights presentation, but I hadn't really read the entire book. And last spring, um, I dug into it and I think I had it done in two nights and just to have um, a, a first edition. So the book itself is over a hundred years old and to, to feel the, the weight of the paper and to, to smell the history, the aging of the book. And it really just um, continued to reinforce and, and entertain me in ways. Um, and so I really do recommend it as a, as a read, if you're interested in Elizabeth and her, her life at all, or life of, of uh, Northern Michigan history and Beaver Island itself, a different perspective on King Strang. Um, there's also a children's book um, called Elizabeth Whitney Williams and the Little Traverse Light. And I saw it in the gift shop at the museum there in Harbor Springs when I was there last week. I actually bought this book for my granddaughter for Easter last year. Uh, she's only two, so she's a little young to start understanding it, but uh, it was one that I definitely wanted her to have in her in her collection and, and one that, again, is just a, a fun read about, um, about her legacy. 
Um, and with that, I'm going to, uh, to wrap it up and open up the floor for comments and questions. Well, thank you so much, Diana. That was wonderful as usual, as I knew it would be. Um, and we do have a few questions. Um, a couple of comments as well. One comment just about, um, it seems like it was probably more than 10 miles from Helena Island. Right. right. Um, maybe she meant a hundred. I don't know. That's interesting. <laughs> um, and I will, um, uh, I will, um, I'm calling out um, uh, someone who is on the call right now. Her name is Susan Hitz, and she is a local pastor, but she is also the great, great grandniece. Susan, I'm going to let you unmute yourself so you can say it because she is um, a descendant. There you go. Say, say yeah. what I can't say, Susan. I am a descendant. So um, I live about a half mile from the cemetery here in Charlevoix, and I am the pastor of Harbor Springs United Methodist Church. And growing up, we had a child of the sea on the um, bookshelf, and my parents would tell me the story of how your great, great, great aunt Elizabeth was this lighthouse keeper on the Great Lakes. And when I became the pastor there in Harbor Springs, growing up in this area, I hadn't been in the historical society before. And I turned the corner and I saw this giant picture and it had the cutout and Elizabeth Whitney Williams. And I was shocked. This is maybe four years ago to know that someone else knew or cared about <laughs> my family member and my family history. You know, I have like these scrapbooks and I, it's from my, my great aunt and it says, Aunt Libby and her lighthouse, right under a place where a picture was torn out and isn't in there, but is handwritten on there. Um, wow. In fact, my father was, uh, he loved photography also, and his name was Daniel after his uncle. Oh, so wow. um, yeah, this is family history for me. And so thank you so much for what you've shared. I have been just as moved going to that cemetery. And I really appreciate a lot of the background that I didn't know because my relative is actually Daniel Williams. This is my blood relative. They had okay. no children, so they only have nieces and nephews and mm -hmm. I'm a niece, but um, he's my blood relative. So I know more about his history on Mackinac Island and in Sheboygan and his family because his sister Lucy was my great, great grandmother. But oh, wow. I didn't know the history of Elizabeth when she was younger, just when she was married. So thank you for that. Oh, and if you should call anyone out, you should call out Muggs Jardine, who isn't on here, but is 96 years old, my parishioner, who tells me, Pastor, you want to know stories? Because my mom used to go visit Elizabeth. And she tells stories still at 96. So if you want to call somebody out, talk to her. That All right. Be wonderful. No, this is great. And um, <laughs> Susan, I would love it if you would um, drop your contact information in the chat for me. Um, I'd love to catch up with you at some point and just share some stories. I've got some great historical documents that I'm happy to pass on if that's of interest. Oh, that would and, be so um, wonderful. I'm just, at church tomorrow for Good Friday in Harbor Springs. Okay. I don't know if you'll still be here, but I will put my email in the chat. That'd be and great. Can, Actually, I'm heading to Sheboygan to tomorrow, but... Um, oh. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's been fascinating. My, my genealogical research has been a thing of mine for years since we took a trip to Gettysburg when I was in fourth grade and I hated it at the time, but and in writing my books and doing this other stuff, it's become quite a fascination. And I keep telling my dad, since he hasn't found a lighthouse keeper in our family tree, that I have to just keep researching other lighthouse keeper trees because I need it, I need that fix. And so um, Elizabeth is just, um, she's like, you know, people ask sometimes if you could meet and have lunch with any five people dead or alive. And I think she would be one of them that I would just like to spend a day with just to hear her accounts and to know how passionate she was for what she did. And and I think, you know, that's one of the greatest gifts anybody can have in life is to just do what they love for a living and, and make a profession at it. And, and clearly that was something that she enjoyed or she wouldn't have done it for 44 years. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And my email's on there if you need me. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Sorry to call you out, but I had to, I saw you on there. Um, 
So there are some other questions here. Let's see, um, from Laura, is there any evidence that Elizabeth and Mr. Van Ripper had respect or progressive views for the Native Americans that they were working with? I assume on uh, Garden Island is what she's referencing. Um, I would imagine that she, she did um, because she references her relationship with the Native Americans in such favorable ways when she was in Manistique and then when they had uh, lived on Beaver Island and there were um, some relationships and friendships with the Native Americans. And so I think that they, I think that they continued to have that, um, that respect and appreciation for them um, and, and using their skill sets to kind of teach them some of the, the farming techniques and, and everything so that that would help improve and make a, a stronger, better life for them out on Garden Island. Um, I did have a chance a couple of years ago to, to take a boat ride. Uh, we went from Beaver Island out to Squaw Island and then took a quick little detour over um, just to the, to the beach area there on Garden Island, but I'd like to explore that a little bit more at some point. And did you maybe tell me once, Diana, that her Elizabeth's mother, Elizabeth, was Métis, or? Uh, yes. Right. Right. Sorry about that. Yeah, clearly that would have been a, a big deal as well. Her mother, Angelique, or Angelica, um, and that uh, um, was a Native American. Her father um, was French or British. I'm not exactly sure on John well, Cross. Traders up there, right? Right. I mean, again, it, that, that, uh, was very common, uh, especially in the Fort era uh, on Mackinac Island. Um, let's see, there are a couple other questions, comments. Um, one of them was regarding the children's book and, and I put the link to our museum store down in the description in the chat in case anybody's interested in that. Um, but where were you able to find um, copies of A Child of the Sea? So um, you can order it like through Amazon and they can do a print on demand. I had a, when I found my first edition, I had set up alerts on both eBay and Amazon to search for this first edition. Um, but I think you can, there are several places that are print on demand. And I thought at one point McLean and Aiken may have had them as well. And it actually, you know, right under that as well, it, it does mention that it, it might be in the public domain now. It says, Anna says that it's free on yes. at the Library of Congress if you don't want yes. to read it. Yes, actually you can. If you Google it, you can, I can't read books that way, but um, if you are able to read digitally, you can Google it. And uh, there are a couple, uh, one through the Library of Congress, there's a couple sites where you can read the entire thing um, online as a scan. Um, let's see. Uh, does the Historical Society have any photos taken by Daniel Williams? Yes, we do. The, the couple that uh, Diana shared were actually um, from our um, archive, our collection. We have about, I think it's about 10 to 12 um, matted prints of pictures that Daniel Williams and, and uh, had taken and had printed. We don't have any of the original negatives that they are from, unfortunately. I have no idea where those are. Um, but uh, we do have some of those pictures. Um, Mary right, Jane. Oh, yeah, I was just gonna say, I just saw Mary Jane's comment yeah, come up. I don't know if you've ever been able to do research. So the Little Traverse Museum is in Petoskey, but I, I think she means uh, on Harbor Point, like maybe in their archive. I have not. So is there a separate archive facility at Harbor Point? And if so, that's news to me. So Mary Jane, let's go and take a look. <laughs> I, I will tell you that I believe that there is an archive there. Um, I don't know um, how, how accessible it is, but you're always welcome to try. That's part of the fun of research. Well, I got to tell you, some of the women that were at that luncheon last week had connections out there too. So there you go. I'm, I might have to join the, the Petoskey Area Antiques Club just to connect with them all. There you go. Um, let's, I'm going to put someone on the spot now because I think if Anna is still on the call, um, Anna and I met um, virtually 
a few weeks ago, a month ago, two months ago, I'm losing track of time, but she has put together a one woman show, um, stage show about female lighthouse keepers. And um, she gave that presentation down at Macomb County at the college recently. Are you still on the program, Anna? Yes, I'm here. This is a lovely presentation. Thank you so much. You're so thorough. Oh. It's a lot to cover. <laughs> well, real quickly, if you would um, tell us what you did, and if um, and I know you have a, a, a YouTube link. If you wanted to throw that in there, oh, sure. Um, I, Anna is uh, reached out with some questions about history, and I'm going to try and help her get on the road in Northern Michigan to do her show. So, yeah, Diana has been such a huge help, and obviously. Um, you could see from this presentation that she's incredibly knowledgeable on um, many, many topics and specifically the female lighthouse keeper. So I was very lucky to connect with her and um, put this show together for the Lorenzo Cultural Center, which was doing a series on freshwater history in Michigan. And so we had three different shows. We had a show about the female lighthouse keepers. We had a show about Frank Kirby, um, who was a boat architect, um, designed the Bablo boats and some other boats in Michigan. And then a show about Cornelius Henderson, one of the first black um, architects who, designers who helped with the Ambassador Bridge and the Windsor Tunnel. So um, the show that I worked on um, I think someone mentioned that they came to see it, which is awesome. Um, but there's a short snippet about Elizabeth Whitney Williams, and I just wish that it could be the whole show about her because <laughs> she is fascinating and her life has so much depth and um, intrigue in it. Um, so we're hoping to get some more performances if you're interested in seeing it. Um, yeah, you can connect with me and reach out to the places near you that you would like to have it presented in, and hopefully we can make something happen. Yeah, feel free to put your um, your website or, or your contact info in the chat there publicly. That's totally awesome. Fine. We're all Thank about Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, uh, it was really uh, great. She gets into character and into costume and plays multiple roles at one time and even throws some of the ghost stories in there. So I liked that as well two years of a pandemic and you start talking to yourself and just <laughs> going into characters <laughs> oh goodness um one last question um from me diana is uh where's the best place to buy your books your two books uh all right so sorry i'm writing down mary jane's email <laughs> Again, multitasking. Um, you can go to promotemichigan.com. There's a tab on there for books and um, you can get uh, Michigan's Haunted Lighthouses, which was my first title. Then there's a children's version of that that another author wrote, but it's uh, taken from my book. And then um, Death and Lighthouses on the Great Lakes uh, is available there. Elizabeth is not in any of them because she didn't die tragically and doesn't haunt the lighthouses that I know of. So um, hers is uh, separate, but um, I did uh, submit an article for the Historical Society of Michigan about Elizabeth that they have accepted. Um, I just have not heard if it's going to appear in Michigan History Magazine or in um, the Chronicle, which is their membership magazine or when they just say, yes, we'll take it and we'll let you know. And we have 18 months to publish it. So. Um, not sure when that will show up, um, but they have several photographs and everything. So you pretty much have it in what I presented tonight, but I'm excited about that. And then I also just wanted to mention that um, for the past several years, I've been trying to get Elizabeth um, into the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. And they have a nomination process. In fact, oh, it's due tomorrow. I'm gonna move that to the top of my to-do to do list for tomorrow now. Um, but um, she, I've been nominating her for many years. And um, just as a, as a prime example of a female lighthouse keeper and the dedication that she has to Michigan. And a couple of years ago, she made it to the semifinal round, which is the closest she's made it. Um, but hopefully this year, if everybody could put some good thoughts out there, 
maybe this year will be the year that she gets in and how exciting would that be? That would be very exciting. Um, I think that was the last question that I saw. Um, I don't think I see any more. And so I will just say thank you so much, Diana. That was wonderful. Um, and hopefully we will have you back again for some other performance or, or presentation. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We hope you have a great night and we will talk with you soon. Bye now. Thank you.